limitaciones a los derechos de propiedad intelectual. Conceptos como fair use, derechos de autor, licencias obligatorias, entre otras. In copyright. Merger theories and scene affair in copyright, generosity, functionality, and compulsory licenses, among others. Rodrigo Velasco, Alessandri and uh, Company Chile, Rafael Ortiz, Bollet and Terrero, Venezuela. Moderador. Moderator, Monica Wolf, Wolf Mendez, Associate Attorneys, Colombia. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Asipi, for the invitation. And thank you all that, in spite of the time, uh, decided to be here with us. We have here two extraordinary panelists. The uh, first talk is going to be from Dr. Rafael, who is an attorney from the Universidad Católica Andrés Bello. He has a magistrate in copyright and technology from the Alicante University, uh, member of the OMPI, an associate at the Attorney Buffet, um, Bolet y Terrero, where he is responsible in the corporate department and IP. He is a uh, law professor in new technology and competency rights in uh, different universities in Venezuela and Latin America. He is a consultant from the Max Plan Institution in the area of uh, uh, competency. He's also been an uh, international speaker in over 20 countries. He's been an international consultant of the uh, international organization OMPI. Y de la Sociedad de Autores y Editores de España. And the associations of authors and editors in Spain. He's been published a lot. He's published a lot of papers in industrial rights. He was a founder of the Industrial Rights Association in Venezuela. With you, Dr. Rafael Velasco. Rafael Ortín, I'm sorry. Hello? Se escucha. Bueno, buenas tardes. Para mí siempre. Good afternoon. It is uh, always a pleasure for me to to speak with my Asipi family. I am very thankful for the invitation. It is always good to talk about intellectual rights, and especially if it's in such a beautiful country as Dominican Republic. As always, I have a lot of things to say in very in a very short time. Because of this, let me begin. Este. Uh, can we change the slide? Let me begin with the following quote. In the art of quotes, you always take something as the initiation point that has been an achievement for our predecessors. I stay with this quote to explain how complicated it is about the topic of limitations and deceptions. Bob Dylan uh, has bought Whitman, Tarantino, uh, you know, gets motivation from his favorite movies. In Spain, Fernando de Gaulle, a journalist, discovers at least 555 verses that are uh, superimposed Entre ellos de Benedetti y Arrabal. Uh, like from Benedetti and Arrabal, uh, from the discography, from the rock band Héroes del Silencio and its leader, Bumburi. Ignacio Termillo said about this issue that there must be a concern, a legal concern, but since we've had a collage, what we have is a lot of people that have been affected, but none of them has been uh, damaged. As you can see, the situation is not easy. So where is the limitation? Where is the limit between creation and non-creation? Where is the limit between authorized uses and non-authorized uses? We are going to be talking about this today, uh, focusing on the uh, limitations from the two big systems on the topic. On one side, we have the system of the common law that is based on the general theory of utilization that reduces to a fair reward awarding the uh, uh, the effort and the time that was invested. It's not uh, individualized, but there has to be a necessary interaction between the members of uh, an association to uh, boost the advancement of science that stimulates the social benefits 
through the uh, entrepreneurial activity. Notice I haven't talked about creativity yet. Creativity corresponds to the Latin system, the Germanic system, that, for example, France has belonged to, where the core of power uh, uh, rests in the author. Philosophically speaking, right and uh, pro uh, proprietary uh, get confused here. Let's not forget Chapelier with copyright is the most sacred of all properties. And both theses have legal consequences. The first legal consequence is that the bigger the protection in this system, in the uh, Germanic Latin system, less protection to the exceptions and limitations uh, that is in the common law system, which brings about a second consequence, that the uh, German Latin system is a closed numeric system. In contrast with the common law system, that is an open system with apertus numbers, and because of it is a little bit more permissive, which brings about a third consequence. Because they are uh, closed system, the exceptions and limitations have to be specifically established within the law. And here is where we see the rule of the three steps. In open systems, Open systems are based in jurisprudential rights. Here's where we see the fair use. So on one side, we are going to have the three-step rule. And on the other side, we are going to have fair use. Let's begin with the three steps rule that you know has its logic. The limits have to be subject, or they need to be restricted, to the rule of three steps. The rule assumes in its core the limits. On top of that, the three-step rule is or was born in, as an international instrument for the control of the uh, law processes. And then it turns into uh, interpretation norm destined to judges and national uh, courts. Its justification is based or uh, it's justified on the defense of fundamental rights like the rights to free speech, the rights to education, the right to information, and on a second level, on the failures of the market. Finally, but not less important, the uh, three-step rule uh, seems to, you know, live with fair use, but not in the peaceful way. About the last topic, uh, Natalia Tobon, the teacher, was asking me in a recent interview if both systems, the fair use and the three-step rule, you know, uh, they get confused with each other, and the answer is yes. In 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 practice, both systems are not very easy to differentiate. The biggest similarity between the two systems you can you can see in the screen. The second step of the three-step rule and the fourth criteria of the fair use. But before we go into detail, we have to indicate that the fair use is uh, an exception that is consecrated within internal law in the U.S. But the three-step rule was originated in a supranational rule that was established in at least nine international treaties that I know of. You know, there must be more. To which those exceptions and limitations must abide to, and fair use is one of them. Furthermore, when you have copyright integrated in the Universal uh, Declaration of uh, Human Rights, it became universal. And because of this, the three steps rule, now it uh, takes more importance before the common law, which is of a more general nature. So we have two things uh, into play here. The first thing is that we have observed that it's served in many, many opportunities as a diplomatic ideal way to try and consolidate discussions about the different interests, like cultural, social, economical, and political. Here's where you have common law and the first use. So we can say that the character of the three-step rule is conciliatory. And because of this, the proof is to exercise control over the U.S. institution, the fair use, and not the opposite. 
Vamos a ver cómo se interpreta. So next we are going to see how we interpret in the law the application of the fair use in our uh, German Latin system. In Spain we have the Megakini versus Schroer case. Identifica la regla de uh, the Supreme Court in, the, in Spain identified the three-step rule with the doctrine of the fair use when they, they approved the, the U.S. criteria of the fair use that the appeal judge had made in a hearing. Basically they indicated that uh, the fair use can be used as a guideline if the principle of prohibition of abuse of rights is present, is present and of good faith is present. And also it's based in a figure that is going to be repeated in many uh, sentences of this time, which is an uh, inoffensive use. So, Professor Berkovit uh, criticized this sentence because the application of the proof as he indicated, and I put it here in between quotation marks, can give origin to the U.S. fair use in a completely different way to the Spaniard one that is of civil base, creating uh, creating an insecurity because of fluctuations in the law. So basically, we are uh, we uh, are ruled by legislation most of all. <clears throat> que, eh, One of the conclusions is, sorry, I got lost. Indica que la interpretación, eh, the interpretation has to be strict in the two first steps, de la, meaning que sea una, un caso especial, in the case that is a special case and that it doesn't attempt against the exploitation of the original uh, creation, and it has to be a lot more flexible in the third step. It cannot go against the legitimate uh, desires of the author. Colombia, el caso in Colombia, the case of Luz Marie Giraldo in the Supreme Court of Justice determined the uh, inadequate appropriation of some fragments of the thesis from the ex-alumni in the university. And in that, they compared the three-step rule with the fair use when they uh, said that they have the same function. In Argentina, they don't have the three-step rule. What they have is the quotation rights, and some of them identify that as the fair, the fair use. We have three cases. The first one, Diego Oberiel, and the movie from the uh, boxer Carlos Munción, the one from Diego Gurs, Televisión, that cites the, the above presented case of Monción and the case of ligaments uh, rupture in a case from the nation. More or less, you indicate in them that you admit the exception of the use of images in a TV show and the possibility of replicating TV formats. Uh, in this way, you assimilate the quotation right into the fair use, and they mention again the inoffensive use. In the case of Monson, in the case of, Mon the case of Monson, uh, the person alleged that there was a conceptual mistake when they equalized the quotation rights to the fair use, an institution that was not part of the uh, law enforcement in Argentina, but they didn't take into consideration this argument. And finally, they argued in Argentina Honrado. that they used the expression honored used at the time that they did the Paris uh, decree. And because of this, it has a certain similarity with fair use. And now that we mentioned honored uses, in Ecuador, in the Ituralde case, they determined that in, in contrast with what it's seen in the uh, US law, the cases have to be specifically expressed in the law. Because of this, there is a difference. So it is logic to think that there is a confusion between the two institutions. So because of this, we have to review what fair use is. There are four factors about the purpose and characters, character of use, basically the commercial character of the use, that is the element of reference. About the nature of the protected artwork, uh, protected work, we are going to illustrate this with an example. It's going to be a lot harder for a scientific work and or educational work to, f to frame it within the fair use than one based on fiction on, on real life. The reason for this is that in the first two ones, uh, the element is a lot more difficult to separate from the idea that is, being, that is trying to be transmitted. Because of this, 
In the first ones, the violation is normally going to be duplication of the authorial element. But in the second one, it could be uh, some elaborated theft. Uh, but the quality and the importance of the part that was utilized against the, uh, the, the, art, the work as a whole, basically the quality, the core of the work. An example. I don't know if you remember, I don't see it nowadays, but it happened a lot. Um, the musical uh, popurri, basically you use fragments of different melodies through bridges that uh, put them together. They didn't have a continuance. This is a technique that was used a lot because uh, it was the main melody. You couldn't use, you couldn't apply fair use here. A quantitative uh, case, and we're going to see it later on, is the Oracle versus Google, where they copied 11,500 lines from the source, the main code, but being only 0.4% of what the total code was. The fourth factor had to do with the effect of use in a potential market um, from the protected work. The first thing we have to do is that if it passes the first three factors, but it doesn't uh, comply with the fourth one, there is no fair use. The criteria here is that the most transformative the use is, there are less possibilities that it's been modified in the original market. And because of this, more possibilities to apply fair use. Let's take a look at this with an example. It is more feasible to be considered a fair use of a cinematography piece of art in an educational activity uh, than for it to be qualified the use of the same cinematography art to get funds from a, a, from a beneficiary organization. The first one is not entertainment, but it's educational. So there is a transformation of the use. So the common sense tells us that you will stop paying for some piece of work in the market if you can find a substitute uh, work that is either cheaper or free. So the substitution of the original one or the main one could be the result of reproducing either a good percentage of the work or the core, the main core of the work. Let's take a look at a practical case of fair use. On January 6th of 2020, the Massachusetts court declared Sobre cinco videos uh, it cannot be applicable the fair use about five videos between the year of 2014 and 2016 in YouTube from the artist Prince. The person that was being sued declared that his videos were non-commercial and they were transformative in nature. But the sentence indicates that the recordings didn't add a new meaning into to the original work. Also, they argued that they didn't use any more than necessary, but the sentence indicates that it's not just about the concert per se and its distribution, but each one of the works with a duration of 17 minutes that are the core of the work. They argued that it didn't have any negative effect on the market for the work, but the sentence says that it is negative for the original work because the videos that were uploaded by the user deviated the traffic, uh, making it difficult to monetize it. Once the, all of the topic of monetization about fair use is done, let's go to the three-step rule. It was first originated in the Verna Convenium that happened in Estocolm in 1967, but it also started gaining relevance in the year of 2000 with the case of music in small establishments in the USA through the publication of a special technical report from the um, uh, trading universal organization. A partir de este momento, y no antes, From that point on is that the rule acquired, uh, you know, certain uh, protagonism in the in the law in our countries. Specifically, the OMC uh, sentenced the U.S. for approving a law that was against the Article 13 the one about exceptions and limitations because it exonerated those establishments like bars, uh, pubs, and restaurants to play music that were not paying to copyrights. Basically, 
que the Irish society, porque no se iban a pagar los derechos de los the Irish community was going to be damaged because they were not going to receive money for the music that were uh, was being played in American pops. In this case, when you argue the first rule about whether or not this is a special case, they indicated in the report that they have to be there has to be uh, a typification of the limit. Like there were so many pops, so many restaurants that were going to be benefited from this. That this is not an exception, but a rule. And because of that, to to put a limitation to so many uh, establishments uh, goes against any quantitative laws. So they're not specific cases but they have to be differentiated from generality. They don't exclude the possibility of having exceptions of open character like fair use as long as they respect the other steps in the rule. And finally, they must help the common well-being and justice. In regards to the second step, I'm going to give a few sentences that apply to the second rule. First, the case between editorial and journalist uh, commission versus Google, and the second one is the case of the World Web versus digital journalism. These sentences are centered about the cache capture. That is no more than a reproduction act where the user can access to the same pages in a faster way and later on with the end of putting available to the public all of these um, articles that are uh, gotten by Google News. In this case, they used press typing, that is recollection and the summary of the totality of the news that you see in the different media, the different communication channels, to offer them in a more organized and sectorized way to the companies that contract such services. The content was put to the availability of the public in a systematic way, in a free way, almost simultaneous and almost universally. Obviously obtaining revenue for ads, advertisement, or sponsorship. In other way, the user was not going to the original site, to the original diaries or journals. And because of this, the editors were losing in advertisement. Because of this, you affect the normal exploitation of the work. So the sixth one used a fragment from a program from Tele5 to mock that system. Both of them were competing in the same market, and because of this, they allowed for a competitive advantage at the expense of each other's content. So they didn't overpass this rule either. So here, with the use of these fragments, they don't have a freedom of quotes. So the program didn't have an informative purpose, but just entertaining. Then we have the case uh, Toro Dos Bornes in Sevilla 2006. The Toro Dos Bornes is protected as a brand, but also copyright. There is a duality of protection, two uh, double protection. The main focus was the protection of the brand, and it indicates that the silhouette of the ball that was using without the authorization to uh, commercialization of products have uh, surpassed the initial uh, advertisement purpose, and it has been used in a landscape as an ambientation uh, element uh, that is not the main purpose intended by the brand. But in that area now, we talk about copyrights, and they said that because of the process of culturization, they had to ask for authorization because they were going beyond culture, and they were uh, actually doing commercialization or trading. In this case, the sentence was that there was fair use. In this case, we have the case of uh, Gap versus Berganova, where the reproduction of arts in textbooks didn't affect the, the normal exploitation of the work because they're, uh, they weren't being done for money. That is true. It said on the sentence, there is uh, there is prejudice, but, it can, but it's justified because it was based on a just and proportional cause. There is a modification of architectural um, structures. The question is, can uh, an owner 
add modifications into an architectural uh, structure. The sentence said that it affects the original purpose of the of the work. No serían propias de las expectativas. Because those modifications were not for the expectations of the architect with the origination and construction of that project. Because of this, there was fair use. In the case of Vélez Murillo, also in Colombia, uh, the conversion service or for cassettes and, and compact discs didn't attempt against the uh, normal exploitation of the work because it wasn't done in big quantities. Because of this, it didn't pose a threat to the economic activity. Sobre la conclusión sobre este punto. The conclusion about this topic, what I see here is that the uh, economic analysis of uh, competency is more apparent than real. Actually, there is not really an economic analysis. The third factor is that the limit can't provoke harm the original interests of the author. About the third rule, what I would do is detail it word by word. Legitimate is something licit, something true. The interest cannot be economic. There's always going to be some detriment, some harm, but it cannot be uh, very big. But most of all, it cannot be unjustified. It has to be just, reasonable, and proportional. Basically, the economic criteria is that you cannot have loss of revenue. Finally, and about the disruptive technology in the digital environment, this brings us to another very important topic that we are going to be talk about, talking about through two questions you have to ask yourselves today. Is copyright uh, a, a blockage mechanism for uh, innovation and competitiveness in the technological world? Must there be a more flexible application of the limits in regards to technology? It looks that the recent decision of Oracle versus Google because of copyright and compensatory damages of the software Java that at its time was from Microsystem and then it was purchased by Oracle. It was copied, like I said, in 11,500 lines, 0.4% of the total of the API code the from Google. This copy was based on the fact that it was an organizational structure. We shouldn't uh, overlook that. That it was necessary for the uh, programmers that were hired by Google to activate similar tasks while they tried as much as possible to implement the Android system. Basically, they didn't need the source code. Like the sentence said itself, when you ask for a meal at a restaurant, you're not asking for the recipe. About this sentence, there are several things. First of all, what Google was looking for was to get to the app, to the API, and to see it as an interface between two softwares that are trying to exchange uh, data, like, or like a software and a hardware that are trying to be uh, operational with each other. But you had a protected software by copyright. Uh, Google always alleged or argued fair use. So in the decision, you have to ask yourself, what is the main purpose for the copyright? To compensate the creative work from the authors? Or to promote the progress of science and useful arts? What I said at the beginning is just a confrontation between two systems, common law and uh, copyright. Here, I'm going to make an excursus. Keep in mind the special features of the nature of the software. Let's remember that the functionality is not protected. You have two programs that can be the same or similar, but because of that, you don't have an infraction on copyright. Let's remember the series of the code of uh, Discord in Netflix. When the protagonist of the series was the author of the code from the Google Earth, he said, Google had millions of ways of getting to the same results, but they chose mine. So, following the sentence, the magistrates from the Supreme Court asked themselves this couple of questions. Is the rhythm of innovation affected by the copyrights or the intellectual property rights? Were the intellectual property rights designed in a time when innovation was uh, gotten in a different way? The Google versus Oracle case has a really big component that I think it's fascinating for copyright. The possibility of understanding uh, work as the standard of the industry 
In this case, the structure, the organizational structure of the Java, Muy importante. what prohibits, and this is very important, the uh, cross licenses, cross technological licenses, a lot of them generating income that are inefficient for the technological market with everything that it implies, like uh, interoperability problems, protocol standards, anti-monopoly, functionality, and what some called the facilitations. Basically, I think the conclusion is that there are two ways today in the U.S. of innovating. One is incremental innovation supported and controlled by copyrights and an accelerated and radical innovation that is supported by free writing for legal advantage, which is what happened to be able to create the Android system. So in the topic of technology, we are open to a new world in this confrontation between copyrights and innovation. And I think it needs to be permeated into the uh, technical solutions or patents. Because of that, I want to repeat the words from my teacher, Manolo de Sáenz. In regards to patents and innovation, the rest is to incentivate in open and uh, cooperational environments and with very high speed and obviously without, you know, keep protecting the authors and the companies. There is a crossover that is necessary from exclusion to collaboration. And don't be afraid to relaxing. Uh, the law in this topic. In this way, we can better utilize patents. Exclusion today would be, would make it almost impossible to develop the technologies that we have available, hybrids, collaborationals. Entonces, hay que ponderar la so we have to ponder. We have to put innovation together with incentives. Uh, something else that's happening in this world is the standard essential patents. Essential patents that come from essential facility, basically innovations that have been able to standard. almost be a part of a standard de una industria para in an industry un to be able to use them eficiente. without being a, a roadblock for those patents that are needed to be found. So for the closing, I think Monica is going to close that like we talked earlier. Thank you very much. Dejamos las preguntas para... Let's leave the questions for the end. Sí. A continuación, Next. Rodrigo Velasco, quien es eh, abogado. Rodrigo Velasco, he is an attorney from the Universidad of Chile and he's a musician, or he's a musician and an attorney. Berkeley College de Boston. From Berkeley College, Berkeley College in Boston. He is the director of the Technology and Intellectual Property. Uh, proprietary in the uh, Institute in Chile, uh, both in intellectual property and also in uh, technology, media, and telecommunication. In 2011, he was named among the first three uh, referees uh, for the intellectual property in the Ministry of Culture in Chile. He was part of the Council of Music of the same ministry until 2017 when he started being the president of the Beethoven Association. In 2019, he was nominate, nominated to the Diversity and Inclusion Awards uh, uh, in recognition uh, in pro bono with the Estudio Alessandri and organizations that promote equality in the uh, workforce in Chile. Now he is an active member of the Inter-American Association of Intellectual Property, International Trademark Association, Association, International Association of Privacy Practitioners, and he was recently elected member of the Board of Directors from the International Technology Law Association, where he is also a co-chair from the Latin American Committee. Thank you very much. How are you? Good afternoon. Thank you for being here at this time when we should all be taking a nap. It is a pleasure, and I... Uh, appreciate the invitation from ACP. It seems like it's been a century since the last time we saw each other in Montevideo. Bueno, and we had the virus waiting for us at home. After the presentation from Rafael, that's been wonderful in, in explaining this dichotomy and this difficulty that we have to face, people that work in copyright law between fair use and the system of limitations and exclusions continental de derecho civil como queramos of the civil uh, civil rights however we want to talk we want to call it 
I think it's been, you know, very clearly explained, so I don't want to uh, uh, take a long, a long time explaining that. Also, you have a lot of this information in NACPI or in TRIP, and it's been applied to pretty much the whole globe. And at a national level, it is very difficult uh, to be able to count all of these limitations and all of these exceptions that we have to review each and every time to see if they uh, actually adhere to uh, a non-licensed use without any revenue for the owner, the title owner, especially in the um, audiovisual case or the audiovisual industry. And I would like to give you a few practical cases of those difficulties. In the case of fair use, we know that it is built inversely. It is an analysis that you do after the fact. Basically, it determines a subjective environment of fair use that has to be reviewed later on by a court. In the case of prints, for example, that we're going to talk about later on as well, uh, that way they determine if whether or not uh, there is a fair use or if there was an infraction of copyrights. The difference in between the systems is very evident. Uh, the copyright obviously has this tradition that is based more and more in the rights of personality, moral rights. And you know, copyright is right there on the name. It has a vision that is more economic towards the exploitation of those rights. In the case of Chile, they had a we had a very interesting discussion in regards to the reform in 2010. This was a reform presented by the president in Chile in 2008. And I remember when they launched it, the reform to the law of uh, intellectual property, a lot of us that were invited thought we were in the wrong hall because there was a lot of uh, uh, children, uh, disabled children that were blind. And basically, this was about allowing to reproduce a book in an audiovisual way for uh, a person with no sight to be able to read it. And yes, it is a reform that is based on the uh, Treaty of Free Trade with the U.S. It actually turned out to be a public discussion of the fair use or the system of exceptions and limitations. At some point, they talked about the rule of three steps as an exception to copyright infraction. Basically, every use that complies with no, not affecting the interests of the author or not having uh, you know, an undercover exploitation. A lot of artists went out to the street uh, to protest, the NGOs also in Chile. And at that time, at the same time where you were arguing SOPA and PIPA in the US, uh, you know, they had this, this raid with Mr. Mega Upload 3. It was very political. But the result was very interesting because they determined that there was a problem with the Constitution. And definitely, the three step rule determined that the law had to be the one to establish the limitation. And because of that, you couldn't, uh, you know, give that to the uh, judicial system. So, in results of this, we go to we get to the letter U. Basically, you generated a wider catalog of exceptions. Uh, you know, for libraries to be able to digitalize them, for parodies, for different uses in the audiovisual world. And one of the examples that I want to tell you has to do with the exceptions for audiovisual works. Gerardo, can we play the introductory video? I'm going to take two minutes of our time to tell you about a movie that, at least to me, it was useful to initiate me in this world.
esto es acerca de una película sobre el dictador Pinochet en, es, en Chile. La gente iba a votar en un referendo acerca de si Pinochet se iba a quedar sí o no. El presidente va a ganar igual. De... El presidente va a ganar de todas maneras. Basta, hay que ser más creativos, carajo. Hay que darle la vuelta a esto. A mí la democracia me parece entretenida. Un producto alegre si tú lo planteas. ¿sí? Estamos utilizando un lenguaje publicitario, pero armando un concepto político detrás. Porque sin la dictadura la alegría va a llegar. ¿Qué chucha hace un mimo en medio de mi película? La oportunidad que tenemos de derrocar a la dictadura. Lo que quieran ganar, pero no pueden, no pueden, ¿cierto? Veo problema. Bueno, cuando Pablo Larraín, when Pablo Larraín, the director of this movie, uh, came to us to ask for our help and our guidance, honestly, it looked impossible because it is a movie that is made with material from that time based on the political uh, time that a lot of publicists constructed. This is based on a lot of fiction. Nobody wanted uh, to touch this. So, you know, I collaborated, but I couldn't give them a license or nothing of the sort. The amount of works, including advertisements from that time, use of brands that were used to contextualize this, this movie. This is a movie that was filmed in VHS format, actually, to give them more of the feeling of the television of that time and to be able to mix the scenes of the movie with real scenes. We were able to get some licenses in national television, but there is Excel of about 500 points, 500 topics, with a lot of uh, co uh, question marks. And we had to go to the new catalog of exceptions and limitations that was set in 2010. We even had a, a little excerpt, a little part. That was my nightmare for a long time. It was the example of the publicists to the politicians of the type of publicity that they had to, they wanted to do. For example, like we are the world with the Live Aid for, Af for Africa, we had to get involved with the clients and tell them, like, uh, what's the size of the television in how many seconds uh, the planes are going to be played for and we don't have to pay a $50,000 fee because if we didn't have We Are the World, you know, we didn't have any movie. So what happened? Uh, it was great. They won the, the, the award in Cannes. And, you know, good news for the client is good news for us. Sony Picture Classics offer them a distribution contract for the U.S. Y viene lo que a mí me dejaría and now we have here eh, una enseñanza que le what you know taught me a lot that I something that I want to teach you as well. We attorneys we can argue a lot about what is for use and what is not for use and how it reflects in an exception and limitation in the system of civil rights. But definitely the end is here the, er the insurance for errors and omissions. The only thing that a distributor, an American distributor, cares about and generally in the world has to do with the declarations that the attorneys have to comply to that made the chain of titles for the effects of the movie to be insured against uh, being sued. And here you can see the, 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 the guy that is imitating Charlie Garcia, going through the brand and other people that were affected because of their relationship with the military regiment, it was a big mess. But the fundamental thing here is to understand that the, this dichotomy between fair use and exceptions and limitations in our system have to do with the responsibility from the producer in the jurisdiction where they are making the movie. 
acostumbrado que la... We are used for the movies. We were used for the, to the movies, you know, uh, being made in Hollywood, so they always had fair use. Nowadays, you have movies filmed everywhere in the world, you know, in spite of the streaming being in Amazon or Netflix, but they are made everywhere in the world. And that implies that the American insurance no uh, needs to either accept or not accept that there is a fair use with the law or use based in uh, uh, satire or free speech or any other kind of exception. Para nosotros fue un crecimiento. So, for us, con esta productora, uh, this was a really big achievement, along with this uh, producing company. They did very good, and we have been uh, also gathering more experience with several series. Una serie. A little while ago, a series called Isabel, uh, based on a Chilean novelist called Isabel Allende, was very famous, at least in the U.S., and we also had to deal with more or less the same things. You know, like to show how um, uh, toxic uh, her, her husband was. We had to show Miss Mundo in 1984 in black and white with the bikinis. And then we went back to We Are the World, like I said. So we have to convince HBO and the insurance company for HBO that we don't need a license to use that content because we comply with certain parameters that are of incidental use due to the Chilean law and they also belong to the fair use law in the U.S. You know, the issues are... A lot. Isabel Allende has a daughter, Paula, that died a few years ago, and she gave very big authorization. She actively participated in the series to use her name, her story, and all of that. But the daughter died as an adult, and she had a husband. So we had to ask for uh, no, images right to the son-in-law that she has not been in a long time. Eh, she has not seen in a long time. Eh, the other case we had to participate in recently is the series El Presidente. El Presidente was the first series that Amazon did in Chile, and it tried about the corruption scandal from FIFA and the Commonwealth specifically. Uh, they had a Colombian actor. He was like the you know the main bad character. Andres. Andres was his name. I don't know. Anyways, it's a series, and it's a very scandalous series because. Obviously, he tried in a very raw way, you know, real names of people. It went beyond limitations of copyright. It went beyond parody. Uh, we had to base ourselves in free speech and on how to tell a story that had, you know, been to the justice system and somebody that is you know still in jail in the US he is in a witness protection program nowadays and also because it started happening that uh, these characters registered their names as trademarks they thought erroneously thought that they uh, they thought their names were not being able to be used if they register them as trademarks for services of 41 classes. So they thought they erroneously thought that because of that, their names were not going to be used. Now the only uh, action that is still in process is still here. Uh, you know, they wanted to remove the work from Amazon. It is from the, the woman, from the Chilean president. We have a, a lawsuit here that has had everything. Uh, she is there in the corruption scandals. And everything has been varying. From the use of name as a trademark, the use of image, to the most recently one that was a, an accusation of uh, gender violence. Uh, gender violence is a, a little bit more concerning for Amazon than intellectual property. So we are represent, representing Pablo Larraín and Fabula, the producing company, and Amazon. Not because they all want us at the same time, but because at the end of the day, we are working for an insurance company that is paying for all of the expenses that come precisely from the clearance that we did two years ago, justifying that this movie or this series was insurable.
ejemplos hay muchos de que que hay... You know, there are many examples. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to move faster. Something I was saying before in regards to image rights. With Ana Tiyu, a Chilean singer, she's very polemic, very political. A friend of mine, by the way, she decided to use a cacerolazo. It was a hip hop based on real images of the social riots in Chile in 2019. Again, we had TV images, YouTube images, TikTok, Twitter, and we didn't know who the, the owners were. I think we took a month to be able to upload it into YouTube without YouTube automatically downloading it for using like content they, they identified as CNN or uh, other news. They blocked it. When we finally got to upload it, they blocked it for being violent, having violent content. So we had to auto-censor the video, and uh, we had to uh, take off some of the violent scenes to make it viewable. But this is something contrary to the notice and takedown based on the DNSNA from the U.S. of downloading or, or taking off a video right now on how to upload content that is based on fair use when the robot insists that that is an exclusive right that is uh, protected in the copyright law. Here the most emblematic case probably is the Tansin Baby from Prince. I think uh, Prince is considered a genius uh, in music for a lot of people. He was very obsessed, like Steve Jobs, with suing everything that had to do with his intellectual property. So much that he made university uh, take down this video for this person dancing to Let's Go Crazy. Because he said, what was the notice and takedown, the stupidest notice and takedown in history based on a copyright, a uh, small baby dancing, you know, his mother uh, was uh, filming him in, in, in second plane. What is interesting is that Edin Brockovich, this mother, not only completed the counter notification to keep the video online, but he countersued Universal for the abusive use of DNCA and establishing a precedent that is going to the Supreme Court in the U.S. about the uh, how diligently the uh, owner's right have to be. And I think not only that is a difficulty for the automization and the European directive that wants to, uh, you know, leaked uh, content. They blocked memes, they blocked parodies, they blocked everything. And maybe this precedent is going to be very relevant for us to think twice before asking for a takedown because we think there is an infraction when you can argue with fair use or exceptions and limitations. And maybe the, the other case that was also interesting for me in the in regards of uh, trademark versus uh, it supersized me. This was a very provocative commercial. Imagine how their body reacted. And McDonald's tried several times to base it in uh, copyrights or trademark rights. To me, this is very stupid to uh, basically they could prohibit the use of the propaganda of I'm loving it within the movie, when actually they were referring to a case of freedom of speech. To finish off, now we have uh, an announcement of the second season of El Presidente, now with the history of Joao Belange in Brazil, so we are expecting a lot more lawsuits. Please keep them coming. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, Netflix announced that it's going to be the first story in Chile with the same company. We've even had to change the logos of the police in the uh, the logos on the police uh, cars because they also have it trademarked and also film without the officials, etc. You know, you learn as you go all of the difficulties and 
también más. Probably La Jauría, it's been one of, of the most polemic uh, series in the case of La Manada in Spain, where we have uh, Ana and Nela Vega, which is the actress that won the Oscar um, with a wonderful woman. A lograr, diría yo, está por verse. We have even been able to una uh, make her, make her uh, uh, sing um, a song that she uh, created, but she uh, gave it to a publisher later on. So we are trying to get her to sing it based on exceptions and limitations. Let's see if we are able to win it. Minuto para conversar y discutir. Now we have a few minutes to be able to have a discussion. Thank you very much. Tenemos unos minutos para preguntas. We have a few minutes for questions. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Ecuador. Pablo Salinas from Ecuador. I have two questions. One for Rafael, another one for Rodrigo. The first one. Rafael, what is your opinion on reiterados criterios del the criteria from the justice court in the Andes community in regards to the three-step rule, uh, taking into consideration that the Article 22 of 351 establishes this concept of fair uses, and it leaves the opportunity uh, that the exceptions that are established in the 22nd article are not clauses numbers, but apertus. And in that sense, the Justice Tribune has said that La, la posibilidad de que, de que existan más limitaciones. Definitely the possibility of having more exceptions and limitations in regards to concepts oriented to fair use can be applicable at the level of the community of the Andes. Definitivamente transgredería. And that definitely de lo, de la regla de los tres pasos que tú has they would violate the rule of the three steps that you mentioned and that definitely even the tribune itself can change the concept of the three steps rule because they denominated the proof of triple criteria and they established that the first rule is because you know because if it's honest use I want to know what you think a little bit about what the uh, court says and Rodrigo, your question, what do you think about something that you mentioned that is very important in regards to limits and exceptions that are very specific for each country? Yes, there is protection in regards to the copyright protection is universal. It's not like that for limits and exceptions. So how can we do maybe like a checklist of adherence to know if a piece of work is going to be exploited in different countries that have uh, different limitations and exceptions. You said in the in Chile you have until the letter U. In Ecuador we have 30 exceptions and limitations, but maybe other countries don't have so many exceptions and limitations and you cannot adapt them to those countries and they could constitute an infraction in one country but not in, in another country. Eh, ¿cómo estás? Mi Hi, how are you? In regards to the 351 decision, Como han el tema, to me, the way that they have gone about the subject, decir, it's very similar to the one in Costa Rica. La They're not cumulative, but I think that they are adjustable, and that's not, no está bien. That's, good. that's not good. If you ask me my point of view as a professor that likes to read about doctrines and all of that, I think the decision 351, and I celebrate that, but you know, in an environment like this, they are trying to be more flexible and have a, a little bit more open fair use, which helps us a lot. It helps our clients a lot. Usually, people are going to call us not to violate the exclusive rights of you know the, the copyrights, etc., but to see how it can be used without having an infraction. So I think the court system in the Andes is going towards the right path. 
de if you look at it from the point of view of technological topics de de they have a really big path for disruptive technologies software etc i think they are doing okay because they are getting more flexible in that topic and that's what you have to do you have to to be more relaxed about those rights i think the topic of entertaining for example uh, in entertaining, you know, you have to have more flexibility in regards to the works. More for entertaining than for culture. In regards to the exceptions and limitations, I think that, yes, the system has collapsed because of its nature. Because of the harmonization that exists among the treaties has to do with the three steps rule, rules. But the way each legislation uh, applies that rule is very diverse. We saw it in the reform in Chile in 2010. We have, for example, the the system of quotes is something where everything goes, for example. We try to interpret everything, but it doesn't always coincide with the use, with the incidental use, like it's called in the TV sets. Like I was saying, Monica, before lunch, when Sony Pictures gave us back the, the duty list with like over 500 points, and I was only concerned about whether or not we are the world was fair use, I couldn't even sleep. We also had uh, uh, at, a, at a some time a publicist speaking on set, and he had a picture of Marilyn Monroe in the back, and the U.S. that requires publicity rights. So in the version that was played in Cannes, Cannes and the one in the U.S., we had to erase that digitally. So obviously there is some difficulty there that has to do with the legislation of the production. But this is very practical. Because you have to have a uh, no production goes on air, at least in California, without an insurance for errors and omissions. And in that regard, our role as specialists, you know, in signing an affidavit and saying if this complies with the national law, they don't. They're not really concerned with details. They don't care if we are using the letter N, that is for documentaries or parties. We have so many examples that you can't, couldn't say exactly, but it has to do with professional responsibility and in many cases with taking the decision of, listen, this is not going to fly. Or if this is going to fly, we uh, attorneys have to go with the creatives and they hate us to let us know, okay, I don't want the we are the world scene for more than two seconds. Uh, you know, I, I don't want it to sound as um, as good, uh, and we try to minimize the damages there or risks. I don't think that's possible to harmonize it among all of the countries unless we have a consensus because we keep broadening the catalog. Maybe in that case we will have more freedom because we have like maybe 130 or 150 exceptions. Or maybe we go back to the discussion from 2010. They had problems. The law had to put more limits to the copyright to create a, a, an environment for fair use in the you know community in the Andes. And we had to revise the law. We have one minute. Primero, antes que nada, First of all, Rafael Rodrigo, congratulations for these excellent expositions. Uh, we have always enjoyed your presentations very much, and um, it gives us the opportunity of learning every time we listen to you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a, I guess, a public opinion, uh, sorry, a personal opinion for you. You mentioned the U.S. patent system as a, you know, very lax system, very not very strict system, and it's uh, very, basically it, it, it makes you want to innovate. It incentivates innovation a lot. So we have fair use. 
You mentioned that copyright is not only to protect the title owner, but basically to motivate innovation. And I repeat that a lot. That sentence is very interesting. My question is, how do you see, as a you know attorney from Venezuela and an attorney from Chile, how do you see the fair use system in our countries? How do you see our judges applying that system? Uh, hey. Sorry, we ran out of time. You have to tip your hat when you talk about intellectual property, romantic uh, right, and you have to go to the practice. I always preach fair use for being more permissive because that creates more businesses, more innovation, and other things. La guerra estuvo planteada y sigue. En el 1996, as much as possible, not to talk about reward uh, rights, but rights for advertisements. They tried to remove copyright. They didn't. They couldn't do it. But that tension is still there, and it's still going to be there between innovation and creation. If you ask me today, because of the clients that we represent in many cases, I advocate for a fair use, of course. Maybe OMPI won't let me in there anymore, but that's what I think nowadays. It needs to be more flexible. I am not afraid of the analysis of the three steps. At least in Chile, we don't have a special uh, court for that. Uh, copyrights are handled by the civil court, but I think judges have uh, a civil training that at least allow them to uh, clearly identify when you have uh, you know, affecting ex in economic exploitation. Basically, they uh, also have to do with moral rights when the rights of the author have been affected. Of course, you don't want McDonald's uh, wanting the documentary out, McDonald's doesn't want it to get out, or the history of the uh, situation on the North. But I think there is a way of giving credit where credit is due and knowing, of course, when the exploit exploitation is being affected or uh, basically the rerouting of clientele, the rerouting of click, uh, clicks. And I think that would simplify, simplify the topic a lot. And yeah, I know, but OMPI is not, is not very proactive about changing. Thank you very much, Rodrigo and Rafael. Un honor. It's been an honor. Thank you to our moderator.